to the uh, first of the forums for Saturday's session. Uh, the scene has been set for you uh, in terms of the philosophical mood in last night's program, and, and we'll continue today with the program which has been described. Federalist vision of a representative democracy. Our panel uh, members will articulate that vision from, I hope, four distinctly different perspectives, at least uh, complementary to be sure, but perhaps distinctly different as well. Common, I think, to all uh, four of the presentations, uh, as you will see, it may be that they are forward-looking. Uh, it is a uh, Federalist perspective generally so that we draw upon first principles here uh, for their forward-looking application. Uh, and that is the mutations in a representative democracy occur and confront us, uh, we as Federalists distinguish uh, between first principles and uh, uh, emanations from penumbras. <laughs> uh, we find first principles uh, ordinarily in the language of the first document or in the absence of its language. Uh, our uh, speakers this morning will analyze, I trust, the manner in which constitutional philosophy, uh, in terms of its application to a representative democracy, uh, steers rather than anchors uh, the republic and the uh, incredibly privileged business of self-government. Well, first, just a personal word, if I may, before I introduce the first panelist. Uh, my name is Jim Ryan. I, I am your moderator. Uh, I am not a panelist. And uh, I wondered uh, a bit for a while, uh, especially coming out of the plane, why I am a moderator and not a panelist. And when I got here and read the biographical sketch, uh, then I found out why I'm not a panelist. <laughs> it is because I have no formal education. <laughs> I have no earned degrees. I have some honorary degrees, as you will see from the sketch, but I have no <laughs> education, apparently. That, of course, is a breakdown of communication, I hope. I think the quintessential story about a breakdown of communications with which I will depart, after which I will depart this lecture, is the old canard that is uh, told of uh, the late Ambassador Adlai Stevenson. Now you remember, I'm talking about the real Adlai Stevenson, the first one, <laughs> who, uh, for those of you who are very young, uh, was the Democratic candidate twice against uh, President Eisenhower unsuccessfully it was said about Adlai Stevenson that his, uh, he was so articulate and so eloquent, the former governor of Illinois, that his campaign played right over the heads of most of the American voters. That's sort of a pejorative observation, but that's what was said of him in all events he lost. He wound up uh, concluding his public life pretty much with a distinguished career, I think, as ambassador to the United Nations. And it is true. Uh, that uh, when Ambassador Stevenson uh, was scheduled to speak in the General Assembly on matters of any significance, the, the gallery was jammed with people. He was a great speaker, an inspirational, a gifted speaker, and everybody knew it, and visitors to New York very much enjoyed it. In all events, on the occasion which of his final address to the General Assembly, turned out to be his farewell address, he was, they say, particularly eloquent, and uh, when he finished his remarks, peals of applause rolled across the General Assembly and uh, continued as he left the room and he was met out in the foyer by a host of admirers bidding him farewell and complimenting him on his remarks. And one woman is said to have approached him with great enthusiasm and said to him, Mr. Ambassador, your remarks today were absolutely superfluous. <laughs> Smilingly, he said, thank you, ma'am. Appreciate that very much. I think I'll deliver them posthumously. <laughs> she said, oh, thank God, the sooner the better. <laughs> so uh, he uh, encountered communication just as I have in conveying something about myself. Uh, our first speaker today is uh, Professor Jonathan Macy, who is the uh, J. DePratt White Professor of Law at Cornell. 
His very impressive biographical sketch is there for you to read. I would, that's accurate in his case, I think, if, if abbreviated. Uh, Professor Macy is the faculty advisor to the Federalist Society at Cornell. Uh, his publications have appeared in uh, really all of the leading law reviews in the United States. He has uh, taught law at the University of Virginia, at Chicago, and even at the University of Tokyo. He is article and book review editor, or was, of the, of the uh, Yale Law Review, and clerk during the early days of his career for the great, the really great Judge Henry Friendly of the Second Circuit. Uh, Professor uh, Macy and I had a short visit this morning and I asked him uh, what his topic would be, and, uh, and to abbreviate, not to steal his thunder at all. He will approach the topic assigned to our panel this morning from, I think, two perspectives. He'll address uh, the, the concept of representation uh, as distinct from the concept of democracy, distinctly different. Uh, he will uh, visit with us uh, with respect to those subjects, and that distinction from the perspectives, of course, of the founders, the Federalists, then from the perspective of uh, current practitioners of the democratic process, and uh, with a side trip and observation about the concepts that are underway and enjoying currency in Europe about what representative democracy is. It's a privilege for me to introduce the distinguished professor, professor Jonathan R. Mason. But I give, I'll give my, what I think I'll do is simply give my remarks to Richard Epstein and have him deliver them. <laughs> it would have taken me 40, but he'll be able to do it in, in eight. Um, there really isn't any question that um, we live in a representative democracy, and the topic of this panel is uh, representative democracy. And um, uh, what I want to try and do today, basically, is to explain how uh, modern uh, political practitioners are drawing the wrong inferences from what we all agree on. The fact is the fact that we live in a representative democracy. And I guess I would illustrate my broad point with a, uh, a story about Abraham Lincoln, actually a true story about Abraham Lincoln's days as a lawyer. And he was, uh, he was uh, representing a defendant in a criminal case. Uh, and the prosecution had put forward in a, a rural uh, uh, Kentucky a jurisdiction and put forward a pretty iron tight uh, uh, case for the prosecution uh, in this uh, small uh, farm community. And Abraham Lincoln stood up at the end in his rebuttal and said, uh, The prosecution's gotten all his uh, facts correct, but it's drawn along inferences. And the prosecutor didn't quite know what that meant, but the jury came back in, uh, in 20 minutes with an acquittal. And, uh, and the prosecutor, after the case, asked Abraham Lincoln, Well, what was that about? I didn't understand that point about the facts and the, and the inferences. And, and Abraham Lincoln said, well, there's an old farm story around these parts that uh, goes like this, that the uh, six-year-old boy ran up to the farmer and he said, farmer, farmer, the, uh, uh, your daughter and the farm boy are, um, are up in the hayloft and they have all their clothes off and they're about to pee on the hay. And Abraham Lincoln said, well, I think the, the little boy got his facts right, but, uh, but drew the wrong inferences. Um, <laughs> I think the same thing is, is true with respect to the title, uh, the topic that we're talking about today, uh, which I, I think is, is of enormous uh, uh, current day importance and interest, the Federalist vision of representative uh, democracy. It's really two topics, I, I would suggest to you, uh, or at least I would treat it as such. The first, tide, the first topic uh, is what do representatives do? Uh, and the second uh, topic is, uh, what is the role of uh, democracy within our system of uh, constitutional design? And I want to begin by saying with the, the common thread uh, in these two disparate topics, the first topic being representation, the second topic being the role of democracy, is that the current approach taken in the United States to both of these issues, representation and democracy, um, are um, a historical. Uh, intellectually impoverished, and uh, social welfare reducing, and worst of all, of course, inefficient. Um, uh, and, and let me begin with the first, uh, what uh, about uh, representation? 
And um, as uh, many historians and political scientists have pointed out, most uh, forcefully, I think uh, probably Bernard Balin, there are two competing visions of representation. One is the vision of a representative as an advocate for his or her particular constituency. This is the pluralist vision of representation. And uh, the other vision is a kind of Burkean idea that representatives are supposed to um, be a kind of guardians promoting not their own narrow interest or not the narrow interest of their constituents, but the broader interest of society as a whole. And, and, and the two quick points that I want to make about these rival views about representation are first to say that um, uh, as a historical matter, not only the, the, the framers, but more especially the revolutionaries, clearly re rejected this idea of guardianship uh, and clearly embraced the idea uh, of advocacy. And as uh, Bernard Bailey has pointed out, this idea that, uh, uh, that uh, the, 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 uh, the, the revolutionaries particularly rejected the idea, of course, that, that people in the United States could be represented in, by, by, uh, uh, by the by the English. Um, so, uh, but the, the more important point with respect to this debate is that this, this Burkean idea of, of, of representatives acting as, as kind of paternalistic guardians is not only ahistorical, but it's also an unstable equilibrium. Uh, that is to say that in any political situation that involves the two very simple basic conditions of rivalrous competition for political office, and a situation in which the private interest of a politician's constituency at home differs from the interest of the uh, society in the aggregate. Uh, whenever those two conditions obtain, rivalrous competition for political office, and it's a disparity between the private interest of one's uh, constituency and the interest of the, of the nation as a whole, um, then this Burkean other regarding kind of Republican tradition uh, does not have a strong survival characteristics, and therefore it's a, a, a dis, un, an unstable equil, equilibrium. Uh, and, and you can imagine that uh, very simply, that, that my, uh, my conclusion here can be simply illustrated with the following example. Imagine you and I are running for uh, political office against one another, and you say, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to support this republic, and it's going to cost you $5, but it's for the good of society as a whole. And I'm going to say, forget the republic. I'm going to bring home the bacon to this constituency, and it will profit you $5. I'm going to win. So to the extent that we have some sort of mix of these other regarding, other regarding Burkeans and narrow self-interested constituency promoters, uh, the latter group is going to dominate over time so long as there's rivalrous competition for uh, political office, which, of course, um, there is. So the point here with respect to representation is simply that like it or not, um, uh, representative democracy of the modern pluralist bring home the bacon variety that's so much deplored is not a current anomaly, but it is an, an un, is an unavoidable fact of the Darwinian process. Um, uh, now, uh, the point that I want to make here with respect to the framers, and this brings me to the second topic of democracy, is that this wasn't a mystery. That is to say, the framers recognize um, uh, uh, this point. And, uh, uh, and here I, I want to talk about uh, the framers' idea of the role of, uh, of, a, uh, of, a, um, uh, of a democracy. And um, uh, uh, the, the basic idea that I have uh, uh, with respect to democracy um, is that um, uh, the framers' idea of this subject was much different than uh, the current view of the, of the subject. Uh, the Federalist had a view of uh, representative democracy what, that um, uh, viewed representatives um, in their elected capacity, uh, the, the, or excuse me, the purpose of majority, of majority rule and electing representatives was not to legitimate government or to empower uh, our elected representatives. Rather, uh, the purpose of, uh, of uh, uh, 
democratic government was to uh, serve as a check on government by allowing citizens to throw out uh, incompetent rulers and to align the interest of, of governmental actors, at least to some extent, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the interest of, uh, of, the, of the electorate. Uh, and, and that view that the framers had of the role of democracy contrasts very sharply with the modern view of, uh, of democracy. And you can look at, as uh, Edward Banfield has pointed this out, when he looks at the language of lots of elected representatives, and the language of these representatives is uh, the idea that we are given a legitimate, we have a legitimacy from um, uh, the fact that we're elected re representatives because the people rule. Uh, and this idea that the people rule through uh, democratic processes is in sharp contrast to the language of um, uh, the philosopher who was so important to the framers, John Locke, who, uh, whose idea was that the purpose of democracy was so that the people could judge. So this idea that the framers had that people's, the role of democracy in which people would sit in judgment as a check on the legislature, rather than people as rulers, uh, as a legitimating function, is, um, uh, is, uh, is one, unfortunately, that has been lost here in the United States, although um, I think it's alive and well uh, in Eastern Europe. That is to say, the emerging democracies in Eastern Europe have a much clearer understanding um, uh, of, um, of the role of, uh, of uh, democracy uh, in, 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 than, um, than, than we do, unfortunately, uh, in the modern age here uh, in the uh, United States. Well, the question is, uh, what's really wrong with uh, the idea that people shall rule. It's extremely popular. You look at the Supreme Court's voting rights cases, for example, and the Supreme Court says the voting is extremely important because it's a, it's a, it is a uh, uh, pr process by which people can protect their rights, uh, the uh, court uh, uh, has, uh, uh, has told us. Well, uh, that's simply not so. Uh, the Federalists knew that, and the Federalists said that the purpose of, uh, of a constitutional regime of checks and balances was to uh, deal with a situation in which a majority is united by a common interest to deprive the minority um, uh, of, their, of their rights, so a, uh, a point that Federalist 51 and, 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 and many other aspects of the Federalist Papers make uh, abundantly uh, clear. And if you think about it, there's something extremely um, uh, there's, a, there's a, an extreme tension between the idea of rights uh, and the idea of uh, democracy as a mechanism for protecting those rights. Um, uh, because uh, if, um, if someone truly has a, a constitutional right to something, then by definition, that right should not be subject to abuse in the, in the, in the democratic uh, uh, process. So it simply cannot be the case that uh, the purpose of democracy is to allow citizens to vindicate their rights. Another thing that's another problem with the current vision of democracy uh, as, a, as a legitimating function as opposed to a checking function um, is simply that, um, as uh, many people have pointed out, the, one of the goals of the Constitution was to preserve a common market among the states and to, pro to promote a market system. But as uh, Barry Weingast of the Hoover Institution and, and has pointed out in a recent paper along with um, uh, several other currently uh, working political scientists, um, markets cannot survive in a world of unfettered majority sovereignty. Uh, and that's true for two reasons that I think are very important to us. Um, the first, of course, is the, the obvious, which is that um, it, the majority will attempt to uh, redistribute wealth, not only uh, engage in what many of us might view as a legitimate uh, redistribution to accomplish uh, social uh, 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 to, to further uh, aggregate social welfare and to promote uh, some vision of justice, but also for uh, the uh, narrow social interest of, uh, of narrow of particular interest groups. So you have this, this re wealth redis re redistribution function. The other problem is uh, much more fundamental and important, which is that economic success it requires that entrepreneurs and others make specialized investment in all sorts of capital, including human capital. But these specialized investments uh, leave the people who make such investments open to political expropriation and 
Uh, David Barron of uh, the Stanford Business School has uh, done written a very good paper recently in which he shows how firms, um, as firms grow in terms of the size of their investments, uh, regulators have an incentive to lower the firm's share of profits once the investment has taken, uh, taken place, uh, thereby transferring wealth from the entrepreneur minority to the, uh, uh, to the consuming majority. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and the consequence of this, from the standpoint of uh, aggregate social welfare, uh, of course, uh, is that, um, uh, is that um, uh, the uh, people are less willing to undertake uh, uh, investment, uh, which obviously has a tremendous uh, uh, social cost. So I would suggest that we, would, we, would, we should adopt the, the framers, more historical, and the, the vision of democracy that's emerging in, in Eastern Europe, of uh, democracy as a checking function, not a legitimating function. And I would suggest that when uh, representatives, when Congress uh, tells us that uh, they um, um, are the true uh, source of decision-making power, or should be in this nation because of their unique position as uh, elected representatives of the people, we should view that from its historical perspective, uh, not from its current perspective. Uh, I'd like to spend the minute or so that's remaining to me uh, suggesting some the, the reason why we observe this drift between our current view of representation and democracy from the historical view that the framers embraced. And I think the answer is quite simple, which is that the historical view is inconvenient. The current view empowers Congress by giving their actions a false legitimacy since uh, it's now cloaked in the, in the mantle of of, uh, of, of, of this, of, this uh, of having possessing democratic values, um, and I would suggest that that we should move away from this problem of in, in modern constitutional law in which people uh, wring their hands over the so-called counter-majoritarian difficulty, and recognize that uh, what I think should be quite uh, obvious, which is that the, this was the idea of a counter-majoritarian uh, governmental structure was not only something that the framers uh, did not ignore, but it's an idea they considered and embraced. The whole idea, not only of judicial review, but of uh, checks and balances in government, the separation of powers, the executive veto, all of these things were designed to uh, reduce the efficacy of majoritarianism and democracy and to uh, increase the decision's cost of government. Uh, and if you look at, um, uh, a whole host of actions taken recently in, in Congress, or, or I should say not recently, in the post-revolutionary era, uh, from the committee system to the attempts uh, at the legislative veto, the relentless mark of the internal uh, uh, rules of corporate governance in Congress have been to reduce the uh, cost to government of making decisions, when in fact the framers' goal uh, uh, was to increase uh, those costs. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Macy. Uh, before introducing uh, our next panelist, uh, I'll share with you an interesting but uh, brief conversation I had with uh, Mr. Daniels when he called uh, to tell me about the program and invite me to participate. I asked him what it is he wanted me to do. And he said he could do anything he wanted to do. I've been thinking of a, of a number I enjoy from the second act of AIDA. <laughs> I don't think I have time. But instead of that, I'll uh, utilize the uh, elbow room he's given me to uh, uh, ask you to recognize uh, a friend of the Federalist Society who is with us today. His name is Mr. Joseph Olson. Many of you know Mr. Olson. He is the general counsel of Citizens Insurance Company. And it, because of uh, Mr. Olson, has been very generous in uh, funding and supporting the activities of the Federalist Society, these national conferences, and others. And Joe Olson is uh, uh, currently uh, instrumental in founding a new Federalist Society chapter for lawyers in Detroit. And I simply want you to know him and to say to him how much we appreciate, Joseph, your support of the society. <laughs> Our second speaker is uh, Mr. David Epstein who is counsel with the for the Department of Defense in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Mr. Epstein has been, uh, in, his, in an earlier life, an academic, 
professor of political science at uh, the New School for Social Research in New York. He has taught as well at the University of Maryland, educated at Cornell University and uh, at Harvard, at which he uh, earned uh, his PhD in 1979. Mr. Epstein is an author in uh, the constitutional law field and uh, is indeed the author of the publication the book, The Political Theory of the Federalist, published in 1984 and which he said to me with a wry smile, which is now in paperback and on sale everywhere. <laughs> Professor Epstein. Thank you. As my contribution to the spirit of controversy that the Federalist Society favors, let me make a small objection to last night's speakers. It seemed to me overall they were somewhat too forgiving too willing to overlook inconsistencies, hastiness, looseness of expression in the Federalist, and forgave them on the grounds that they didn't have much time and had a practical task ahead of them. I think this kind of uh, uh, spirit is, is very admirable in a teacher and perhaps even in a judge, but I think it may uh, lead us astray when reading the Federalist. If we give them a pardon before they have exhausted their appeal, we are not led to reflect on what the inconsistencies may point to. I think that's a, a way of grappling with the Federalist thought and trying to understand um, what's behind the apparent contradictions. I believe the Federalist is, in fact, a model of precise writing and coherent thought. I cannot demonstrate that altogether, but I would like to try to show that with respect to two issues uh, that grow out of Federalist 10 and conclude by contrasting the Federalist view on these matters with some current in contemporary American society, perhaps even in contemporary Federalist society. The, the, the uh, issues I would like to raise come out in Federalist 10, and in fact, uh, it's been handed, I believe, at the door a copy of Federalist 10. And if you look in the second column of the front, Madison says, by a faction, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Now this rolls off one's tongue very easily, but notice the distinction between passion and interest. Notice too the distinction between the rights of other citizens and the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. I don't think this is loosely written. I think these are two very fundamental distinctions. And in fact, if you read the rest of Federalist 10, you'll see those distinctions are repeated in many different forms. Uh, the rights of others as opposed to the general interest of the community is sometimes stated as the distinction between justice on the one hand and the public good on the other. Let me describe the basis of these two distinctions. Madison proceeds here to analyze the causes of faction, which are liberty, allowing men to divide themselves up into groups, and diversity, which provokes them to divide themselves up. The diversities, Madison says, are ineradicable because reason and passion influence each other, resulting in diverse opinions. What's most important for politics is that opinion becomes the object of our passions. That is what makes a faction. People get passionate about their opinions. Now, this is such a common experience. You may even see it at this meeting. It seems commonplace, but why do people become passionate about their opinions? Why should we care whether other people agree? If they understand, fine. If they don't, maybe they're stupid. Maybe we're wrong. But why do people have heated arguments? Madison gives examples of this if you turn to the second page. In the first column, he says, a zeal for different opinions concerning religion, concerning government, and many other points, as well of speculation as of practice, an attachment to different leaders ambitiously contending for preeminence and power or to persons of other descriptions whose fortunes have been interesting to the human passions have in turn divided mankind into parties, inflamed them with mutual animosity, and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good. So strong is this propensity of mankind to fall into mutual animosities that where no substantial occasion presents itself, the most frivolous and fanciful distinctions have been sufficient to kindle their unfriendly passions and excite their most violent conflicts. Notice he says, people with passionate opinions want to vex and oppress people who disagree with them. 
Disagreement makes them anger. Or maybe anger makes them disagree. If they don't have anything to disagree about, they find something. Madison's statement reminds of Gulliver's Travels, where the big Indians and the little Indians dispute over which end to crack their eggs at. Madison's concerned here with religious doctrinal disputes, which have their origin in man's belligerent self-assertion. I would say this is a kind of ambition, maybe a mild kind. People don't necessarily insist on ruling, but they want their opinions to rule. All of this about passionate factions. Madison then describes another kind of faction, that based on interest. That results from the fact that diverse faculties of human beings result in diverse kinds and degrees of property. Government's first object is to protect men's unequal faculties, and this results in protecting property. Madison agrees with Locke on this point, that the government is instituted to protect property, but Madison states the object not as protecting property, but as protecting faculties. Protecting the faculties of man is the first object of government. That means our faculty of living and breathing, also your ability to labor and think up ways of acquiring property, and government protects that by protecting the fruits of acquisition. Madison says this kind of uh, in interest and property are the most common and durable source of faction. If you compare what Madison says about passionate factions and what he says about interested factions, you notice some, some differences. Interested factions are common and durable. Passionate factions are intermittent. They come, as he says, in turn. They divide people up according to some opinion which gets hot at a particular time and then maybe goes away. So successively, we have passionate factions around Vietnam, Watergate, women's liberation, nuclear war, abortion, federal funding of performance art. But they don't all happen at once. Passionate factions are more explosive. Passionate factions like to vex and oppress their opponents. Interested factions, he says, are interfering, and government has to regulate them. Labor wants more, so management gets less. But that's just a side effect. Uh, interested factions are not out to get management for the thrill of it. That's the characteristic of passionate factions. Madison says interested factions are so common that the regulation of these interests is the principal task of modern legislation. You think about that sentence. Madison has said that all government has or should have the object of protecting faculties. It is modern government that interprets that object as implying the task of regulating interests. Ancient and medieval governments had a different interpretation of man's faculties. In Federalist 8, Hamilton describes the ancient republics as nations of soldiers, where the important faculties are courage and virtue, not the ability to pursue economic gain. Medieval legislation thought men's crucial faculties are their eternal souls, and that's what government should protect. Overall, modern government, according to Madison, I think, hopes to avoid the explosive contention of passionate factions by limiting government to the protection of acquisitive faculties. As Thomas Jefferson said, limit government to pre prevent men from picking my pocket and breaking my leg, but leave the rest as a private matter. The problem is that passionate factions are not necessarily involved in modern government, but they arise anyway. Human beings divide themselves into passionate groups even if no substantial occasion presents itself. It was this tendency that led the modern thinker Thomas Hobbes to argue that given the end of protecting man's faculties, one had to abolish political liberty. Madison's project is to show that uh, protection of faculties uh, can both protect the, the faculty of opining or passionately opining and protect the faculty of acquiring property. To jump boldly to my conclusion, which I will not demonstrate, I believe this passion that Madison describes is what justifies popular government. Man's selfishness does not simply take the form of economic self-indulgence and the self-denial necessary to economic self-indulgence. Selfishness takes the form of self-assertion. We have a passionate wish to assert our own will, and popular government respects that wish. I think the key question here is, why does the Federalists not accept a mixed government? If, as Professor Macy said, democracy was only as a check, England had that. One popular branch is enough. The Federalist says we have to have a wholly popular government because only that is reconcilable with our honorable determination. 
Let me speak more briefly about the distinction between the public good and justice. Both of these are described in the Federalist as the end of government. Federalist 51, reprinted by our hosts, says justice is the end of government. It is the end of civil society. Federalist 45, not reprinted, says the public good is the supreme object that government is designed to serve. Now this, I would say, is not a contradiction. This is a guide to further thought. And if you study the Federalist on this question, you see a large degree of interdependence and harmony between the public good and private rights. Private rights depend on the existence of a public because our rights are not secure if foreigners can invade or criminals can attack us. Injustice causes rebellion and therefore destroys the public. For that reason, respect for justice is necessary to the public good. And protecting people's rights promotes prosperity, which is good for the public good. I think most fundamentally, justice is the final object. That is called the end of civil society. The public good is commonly the object government pursues. Justice is supposed to be the condition government establishes. If you look at the preamble to the Constitution, it says to establish justice, but it says to promote the general welfare. I think that's exactly the distinction you find in the Federalist. The public good is government's task, but uh, justice, even though government need not ordinarily promote it or pursue it, is always at risk. If you look at the second page of this handout from Federalist 10, uh, near the bottom of the first column, Madison says, what are many of the most important acts of legislation but so many judicial determinations? Not indeed concerning the rights of single, single persons, but concerning the rights of large bodies of citizens. Legislation properly understood is judging. So far from saying that judges should legislate, Madison says legislators must judge. And that is because rights are in danger not simply from takings, but from regulation. Any regulation may impinge on, on uh, the, the exercise of human faculties. The problem this leads to is that justice or rights cannot be reduced to a set of rules. This is why the Federalist does not recommend a Bill of Rights as the security for justice, but recommends political institutions and social diversity in the extended sphere. Parchment definitions cannot define all of our rights if rights means the protection of human faculties. Let me conclude with two contrasts between the Federalist and uh, contemporary thought. I believe today people do not look to the non-judicial institutions to protect our rights. And that is related to a change in the view of rights. In the Federalist, I think natural rights were thought to be naturally attractive to human beings, generally supported by the people, except when the people are distracted by some passion or interest that leads them to oppress others. Uh, but um, in moments of calm, the people will support rights. Now, I think, in, say, if you look at Rawls, where he says uh, that justice in the distribution of wealth is revealed by considering what men would consent to when uh, faced with a veil of ignorance as to their particular circumstances. What that means is that actual human beings would not consent to that kind of justice. And therefore, even in moments of calm, uh, the democracy cannot be expected to support rights. The second uh, point of, of contrast with contemporary thought, I think, is on the question of why popular government. I think popular government is now understood simply as a means in the common phrase. It's the worst form of government except all the others. The Federalist, I think, describes popular government as an end in itself that satisfies part of our human nature. In the contemporary view, politics is simply a means of bargaining for private protection and advantage. Voting is a form of lobbying, and not necessarily the most effective form. I think this leads, uh, on the one hand, to Marx, who says, at an advanced stage of economic development, this protection and advantage can be available to everyone with no politics. Or in deference to regulatory agencies and courts, uh, if electoral politics is only a form of lobbying, perhaps a better job of adjusting the different interests can come from non-elected officials. Save us all a lot of trouble. In the Federalist words, 
the case for popular government rests on an honorable determination, meaning an honorable determination about our human nature. And without that honorable determination, I think self-government comes to seem a possibly dispensable means to non-political ends. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Epstein. Unless you think that this uh, panel will be uh, all morning an ideological sleigh ride, I want you to be uh, aware that uh, before we're finished, we will hear from uh, a speaker who uh, does not necessarily sing out of the hymnal which has been distributed to the audience today. Uh, I want to also remind you, should have earlier, that uh, we'll devote a good portion of the time allocated to this panel to a question and answer period. I know most of you are familiar with that tradition, but uh, be assured that uh, we're anxious uh, and look forward to hearing your questions and our panelists will deal with them. Uh, before introducing, or really in the context of introducing our next speaker, Professor Frank Easterbrook, uh, I want to share just a thought with you, and that is uh, this. To uh, so many of us, of you, who are devoted to the work of this society and the exchange of ideas concerning its principles, uh, it is uh, your life, many of you, to see the principles uh, upon which the Federalist Society rests examined uh, and discussed and debated in the uh, relatively abstract environment uh, of the academy. Although uh, we know, obviously, that how crucial that forum is to, for the exploration of old concepts, newly applied, uh, save for which forum, uh, many of the ideas which uh, deserve to be rerouted in constitutional jurisprudence particularly, would have been aborted early on many campuses. But uh, the next speaker and I have the privilege, I speak only for myself here and not for him, have the privilege of living each day uh, uh, with a new jurisprudence of judicial self-restraint that I uh, am comfortable to tell you has largely transformed much of the uh, jurisprudence of the Sixth Circuit, where I'm privileged to serve. Uh, not as regards the uh, great cosmic constitutional issues. That revolution uh, takes place naturally enough, largely in the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, still, in an intermediate uh, federal court of appeals, there uh, is the opportunity and, in my judgment, the duty to be alert to the obligation to, app to apply the first principles which animate much of what we're talking about today. Uh, in myriad ways, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Sixth Circuit, uh, the commitment that was made in Detroit in 1980 to uh, attempt to find and to appoint the federal judiciary men and women who would rediscover the, uh, in some instances, nearly lost concept of judicial self-restraint is a commitment which has been honored dramatically and uh, it is uh, a rich and an interesting and a disciplining experience in my circuit to see that uh, with the coming of uh, eight new judges, a majority of our circuit, there is uh, a rediscovery and a new sensitivity to many of the root constitutional principles, particularly separation of powers. A judge who has uh, built uh, an admirable reputation for respect for that and, and other first principles is your next speaker, Judge Frank Easterbrook of the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. He is an old friend for all of us and, and, uh, and a familiar speaker for many of you, uh, but for those handful who may not be uh, fully informed about Judge Easterbrook's background, he was, of course, an assistant solicitor general of the United States, a uh, member of the faculty of the law school at the University of Chicago. He has widely uh, published two books, a host of articles, dozens and dozens. He has taught and written in almost all the fields, antitrust, constitutional law, criminal jurisprudence, criminal procedure, and all the rest. His most recent publication is uh, The Economic Structure of Corporate Law, which was published just last year. Judge Easterbrook holds degrees from the Swarthmore uh, and the University of Chicago, a member of the American Law Institute and a frequent contributor to the work of the Federalist Society. I'm privileged to introduce Judge Frank Easterbrook. I'm 
Thank you for the introduction. I'm pleased to report that judicial restraint has reached the Seventh Circuit. There are some people who believe that judicial restraint has reached the Eighth Circuit. Uh, further deponents say it not. The, I think it's wonderful that at the eleventh meeting we are at last going to talk about the document uh, from which this society takes its name, the Federalist. Uh, in particular, on this panel, the Federalist view of representation. The Federalist view of representation is a view of methods to control the problem of faction. What is faction and how is it to be controlled? Well, faction, in the language that's just been quoted to you by Mr. Epstein from the Tenth Federalist, is self-interested voting contrary to the common good. And the founders saw it as a scourge of republics. It leads to contentiousness. It leads to local favoritism. It leads to beggar thy neighbor policies. So it has to be dispatched. But faction is very strong. People care more about their own interests than about the interests of others. And they care more about their own interests even when they know intellectually that virtue is good. One way they bring this under control is by coming to believe, and it's easy to believe when you know the psychology of cognitive dissonance, by coming to believe that public virtue and personal interest just happen to be aligned. And after people come to that realization, they are impervious to further argument. There is therefore a need not for argument, but for control. And yet, faction is beneficial. Where does faction come from? Faction comes from differences among the members of the Republic. What do we mean by differences? Differences are another way of describing the division of labor in society. We look out and we observe some landowners, some farmers, some merchants, some professors, some other stations of life. All of these are ingredients, and should be ingredients, of a prosperous economy. Difference in religion is an ingredient of moral life, and differences are to be treasured. They are the hallmark of freedom. They are an objective of our form of government. And yet those differences are faction. They are the source of faction, and therefore in the end must destroy our government. The picture is not a pretty one. How then are we to deal with it? We can't extinguish the differences and wouldn't want to. We can't suppress the result of faction without eliminating the role of the governed in government and getting tyranny in exchange. And if we cannot extinguish it, we must then control it. How do we control it? This is the program of the Constitution and its justification, the program particularly of Federalist Number 10 and 51, which you have all, I hope, now read. One method of control is the method of making indirect decisions. Instead of direct democracy, we have representatives. And the representative's self-interest will not be the same as the constituent's self-interest. That, at least, is the belief. The representatives, Madison argues in the Tenth Federalist, will therefore have a larger portion of virtue, not only because there are few representatives in relation to the total number of people in the, who are electing them, but also because the representative represents people of many different interests and therefore is not fully responsive to each. What we would call that today is an agency cost, a form of agency slack. The agent is an imperfect representative of the government. And Madison argues that is a source of great security, that the imperfect agency is a good. The second method of control is fragmentation of the electoral base. The elections are made from different states, and the states have different factions. The mercantile class may dominate in Philadelphia, and tobacco growers may dominate in the Carolinas, but none of these factions dominates in the larger republic. The diversity that is a source of faction locally is also the security nationally, because the power of each faction may be diluted. Well, how, how do we evaluate this understanding of the representative function. In my evaluation of the 10th and 51st Federalists is that they are the best piece of political philosophy ever to be written on this side of the Atlantic, and maybe the other side as well. To recognize both the inevitability of faction and to conquer it by division is genius. 
And the divisions are, of course, employed plentifully, not only between state and federal, not only in the different constituencies from which elections are held, but also by differences among those constituencies within the federal government, with the House, the Senate, the President, all having different constituencies and different terms, running from two years to life. Well, actually, the term for judges is good behavior, but we know that judges are such virtuous persons that good behavior and life must be the same term. <laughs> the, the 10th and 51st Federalists also anticipate, without quite articulating a point that has now come to be associated with uh, Thibault, that when there are many subordinate jurisdictions, the plurality of them controls local faction. A faction can't strangle the local commerce of Philadelphia or Pennsylvania without getting it to move. And in the United States, of course, as a federal republic, movement is possible. So the division among jurisdictions ends up handling faction at both levels, while the multiple jurisdictions make it possible to accommodate multiple and different tastes. Now, Richard Epstein reminded you last night that the public schools are governmental schools. But I may remind you in the terms of the Federalists that you can shop for your government. But it hasn't worked out. Private interest legislation is common. And it is more common at the federal level than at the state level. It is the opposite of what this great piece of political philosophy told you would happen. Why? I think the prescription has been, uh, in practice, falsified for several reasons. Let me cover them for you very briefly. First, the concept of agency space for the representatives rests largely on a belief that it is difficult to monitor what they are doing. Similarly, the concept that factions cannot dominate at the federal government rests on a belief that it is difficult for them to coordinate their behavior. That's a reasonable understanding of things in the late part of the 18th century. Communication and transportation are both difficult and costly and slow. By the time anyone determines what his representative is about to vote for, the vote has already happened. But as the cost of transportation and communication fall, it is easier for groups to unite, easier for people to monitor what their representatives are doing, the agency space within which virtue is to operate falls. The representatives become more faithful representatives of their constituents, binding public action more closely to private interest. Related to this, too, is the fact that as the cost of transportation and communication fall, the size of the internal market in the United States rises. That cuts the power of states, a faction at the state level, by making exit easier but increases the division of labor. And George Stigler had a, a short and pithy phrase expressing this. It was, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. As the size of the market grows, division of labor is more possible. And now the society is much more interdependent than it was two centuries ago. More specialization means more and more powerful factions. Now, the biggest problem with faction is, of course, free riding. Legislation in the service of factions is beneficial to all the members, but no one member wants to bear the costs of lobbying for it, of campaigning for it, of otherwise getting it. Everyone would like to receive the benefits without the cost, the free riding problem. The larger the faction, the greater the free riding problem. A more cohesive, smaller faction is likely to be more effective in lobbying for two reasons. One, the benefits are more concentrated. And two, the faction may be more cohesive and smaller because it's much harder to lead it. That is, it may be organized, it may have come into existence for reasons that are totally unrelated to any possibility of lobbying for legislation. <coughs> the strength that holds the factious group together may also be the source of its advantage in lobbying for legislation. More small factions, it may turn out, are easier to organize and to use in the legislative process than fewer large factions. And the log rolling efforts among minority factions may then turn out to be the biggest source of danger in a representative government. This was something Madison did not foresee. Almost all of the language in the 10th and 51st Federalists is concerned with the idea of majority factions. 
possibility of very effective coalition building among minority factions was an unprovided for case. And as the cost of communication and transportation fell, it became easier to organize minority factions. Now, of course, Madison was certainly right that the national level is much harder to organize than the state level. There are more factions. It's more difficult to coordinate with people long far away in other states. But of course, there's a countervailing consideration. There's much more to be had by organizing factions at the national level. Power of factions at the state level is limited by the power of exit, the TPO effect. But the national government can stop the power of exit among states. That is, the national government can monopolize in a way that no state can. And much national law is argued for on exactly this basis. Those of you who have had occasion to read the Supreme Court's opinions sustaining the New Deal legislation may be struck by the justification the justices of the Supreme Court of the United States were giving for national laws, such as the minimum wage law that was sustained in the Darby case. The justification that the Supreme Court was giving was precisely that the power of exit and the power of markets was controlling factions at the state and local level. And therefore, the justices said, it is essential that Congress's power under the Commerce Clause be expanded in order to stifle that power of exit, which is dissuading states from passing legislation. It is an argument, in other words, that national legislation is necessary because Madison was right, and we have to do something about that. <laughs> Factions try very hard to organize the national level because of the much greater gains to them at that level. So on balance, it seems to me, we should agree with Madison that the national level is less vulnerable. It is harder to get legislation. There will be fewer factious laws, but we should also think the loss from each one is great. What other things have happened in the two centuries since the Federalist Papers? Well, the lure of faction at the national level has grown dramatically in this century uh, for one very good reason. It's a constitutional reason. It's the 16th Amendment giving the national government the power of taxation. Your desire to organize a particular level of government in the service of faction rises with the percentage of society's wealth that that level of government controls. The national government, in the wake of the 16th Amendment, controls whatever percentage of society's wealth it cares to control. That makes it a much more attractive target. People are willing to spend more resources to organize on the national level. And the restraints have simultaneously been relaxed. The 17th Amendment, eliminating uh, the indirect election of senators, collapsed to some degree the electoral bases of the national government and removed one of the precautions uh, that the Federalists thought was important to the control of faction at the national level. And if one could go on with the, with the nature of these changes, I think the trend is clear. I think it is understandable simultaneously then that the Federalist is right, that it is great, and that it is wrong. We live in a political world of faction and must either seek other solutions to its control or accept the current ones after recognizing, as Madison himself did in the 10th Federalist, that all the alternatives are worse. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge. Our uh, next speaker, final speaker, before we move to the question and answer portion uh, is uh, Dean Jesse Chopper uh, from the University of California at Berkeley School of Law. Uh, Dean Chopper uh, very kindly agreed to participate in, in the program today. Uh, well known to all of you, a leading constitutional uh, law authority in the nation, having written uh, one of the definitive case books in the field of constitutional law and another in the field of corporate law. Uh, Dean Chopper served as a law clerk to Chief Justice Warren uh, in the early years of the 60s. He taught thereafter at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, taught law at the University of Minnesota, 
and uh, then for uh, the last period of his academic career at Berkeley. His publications are uh, numerous, one of which uh, is referenced in the, in the biographical sketch, Judicial Review and the National Political Process, a Functional Reconsideration of the Role of the Supreme Court. Among the, among the lecturing Dean Chopper does uh, about the country, uh, is an annual stint in Washington at the United States Law Week's annual Constitutional Law Conference, where uh, he does uh, a well-known and very popularly received number with Yale Kamisar and Professor Lawrence Tribe, the three having uh, addressed uh, the current recent developments in constitutional law uh, each year. He has delivered the Cooley Lectures uh, at Michigan, the Karras Lectures at Syracuse, uh, and really across the country, he is uh, the national president of the Order of the Coit. I think, I hope it will be fair to say uh, about Dean Chopra's presentation today that uh, he was interested in reacting to uh, the presentations made by the first three speakers, providing a perspective which will uh, design do it will, I'm sure, stimulate thought, lest we all think we are singing out of the same hymnal. Dean Chopra. Thank you very much, Judge Ryan. I want to say that it is a uh, real pleasure for me, and uh, uh, I, uh, I mean that strongly, to return to this uh, meeting of the Federalist Society. Uh, I uh, don't remember exactly how many years ago it was uh, that I participated in such a program, but I have followed them uh, with care over the years and have uh, been regularly impressed. This is a self-serving statement, I guess, by the quality uh, of, the, uh, of the people who have participated in them. But, uh, I, I have a title uh, for, uh, for my remarks, uh, which I have just constructed, and it is uh, Random and Mainly Unconnected Points and Thoughts on the Federalist Vision of Representative Democracy as Viewed at the End of the 20th Century. Uh, there's a subtitle, uh, or How Have We Used the Legacy uh, of the Federalist Papers? And uh, my, my first point uh, is that I am not a student or scholar. Uh, of the Federalist Papers, I've read them. Uh, but as a layman, I really uh, uh, am prompted to express my admiration uh, for this uh, truly extraordinary set of uh, essays. As someone on the panel last night said, this, this after all, was probably uh, just a, uh, a first draft. Uh, it was done without the luxury of uh, any greatly flexible uh, deadline. Uh, they were produced, at least to our knowledge, without law clerks. Uh, without, uh, without, without research assistance, uh, and without the uh, help or hindrance of the of the articles editor or some uh, law review, and uh, I, I I think too that they were in all likelihood produced without any real any real conception of the fact that each sentence, indeed each phrase or uh, each word, uh, was going to be scrutinized and parsed. Uh, in, uh, in, in the way that they have. I think if you re reflect on that for a few moments, you have to, uh, you have to feel an extraordinary admiration uh, for, uh, for this product. Well, I, I go on to my, to my next uh, uh, point, uh, mainly, as I said, un unconnected. Uh, Professor Macy said that there is no question uh, that we live today in a representative democracy. Uh, well, I, I think as a, as a uh, quantitative matter, that's true. Uh, I'd like to look at it uh, for a few moments as a, uh, as a qualitative uh, matter. What sort of representative democracy do we live in? Uh, three, three vignettes, uh, I, I think, should cause us to pause and question what the quality uh, of, uh, of our representative democracy uh, has become, both in terms of, uh, of we who are, who are sending forth uh, the, uh, the representatives and the representatives themselves. I'm going to try to make this as nonpartisan a statement as I can. But what does it say uh, about the, the nature or quality of our representative democracy, both in terms of the elected and the electors, when the, uh, the leader uh, of the party in power in nominating a Supreme Court justice, uh, Clarence Thomas, uh, says uh, that uh, this is the product of a nationwide search, and he has come up with the most the single most qualified candidate in the country in which race has played no part. And we all sit back and, and, and we sort of snicker, 
uh, a little bit, but that's expected. It's expected that, that we are that we're that we're fooled uh, in some way, or probably even worse, that we're not fooled uh, by by what is being said. Uh, what does it say when the congressional leaders of the Democratic Party, uh, the leaders uh, in Congress, usually the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the majority leader of the Senate, after in the last half a dozen years passing the annual budget, appear before the television cameras and say, well, we, we've done it again, smoke and mirrors. Uh, we've promulgated another fraud on the American people. We all know uh, that what we've done is inconsistent with our statutory charge, uh, with our obligation to the people, and, and indeed inconsistent with what we think is in the national interest. And, and we have, uh, the media reports this, and we, 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 we all sort of accept it. Yeah, but of course that's true. They did it again. Uh, a, a national magazine this week talks about the primary campaigns being conducted uh, in different parts of the country and comes to the conclusion uh, that uh, former Senator uh, Paul Sangas and uh, uh, Pat Buchanan are the two candidates who are really telling the truth to the American people. Of course, the magazine goes on to point out that they have the luxury of being unelectable. Uh, so, uh, it, uh, uh, I'm, 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 this is a, a direct quote. I, I believe it was Newsweek magazine. It's a direct quote, and it's a fact. I mean, I think if we reflect on that for a few moments, uh, we have to say that that is the product uh, of our uh, of our representative democracy. Uh, I, I, I think it has to give us uh, some some pause. Uh, I think, um, as has been pointed out, as, as perceived uh, by the uh, by the Federalist Papers, uh, it, it, it is not a question uh, of our elected representatives not being intelligent. Uh, I, one, one cannot speak about each and every one, uh, but in the course of a, a variety of enterprises, I've come into contact with a number, both at the at the, at the national, the state, and the local level. They are intelligent people. And indeed, I think they are politically responsible. Uh, the question is to whom are they politically responsible, and how do they view uh, the, the, the nature of carrying out that responsibility? I think it's generally agreed that, they're, that, that they act not for the, uh, for the common wheel, in, in, in the main, uh, not uh, for, for the, 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 the public or, or the general interest, uh, and, and this is regardless of what they think is in the general interest, at least in the Burkean sense. But perhaps more significantly, it is regardless of what they think the majority of their, uh, of their constituents believe uh, is, in the, uh, is in the general uh, interest. Uh, they, they, are, they are obviously beholden uh, to something, something else. Uh, uh, Factions, uh, lobbies, special interest groups, or uh, or, or, or or what have you, and and beyond that, I, I think it is unhappy. I, I think it is fair to say that the that the political institutions of, of our government, at, at, you know, at many levels, uh, at virtually all levels, uh, in, in both the uh, legislative uh, and executive branch, are even when they do respond. Uh, are, are simply not effective uh, in dealing with serious problems which confront, confront them with making hard choices, uh, except in the case of crisis. Uh, I, I'll, I'll take what I, what I hope is, uh, again, a nonpartisan and, and, uh, and non-emotional topic, and that is uh, energy. Uh, I remember in the 1960s uh, reading in the popular press, reading in the informed journals of the country that uh, we are, uh, we're going to confront a serious energy crisis. Uh, we cannot continue to sell gas. I, I remember when it was eight or nine cents a gallon, and, and you can, I don't have that much credit. Uh, and uh, we, we were continuing, we, we can't do this, uh, uh, but we did. Well, then in the 70s, when the, when, when the energy crisis came, we tightened our belts. We had uh, alternate days at gasoline stations, big lines, big, uh, 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 very, very uh, successful uh, attempts at developing uh, alternative, or at least successfully beginning, uh, beginning and successful attempts at developing alternative energy sources, uh, storage, conservation. 
Uh, well, I passed. It just all went by again. We, we, we hear the same thing now as we do in the 60s. There's going to be, there's going to be a big, pro big problem about energy. We don't do anything about it. We still want to, we still want to have uh, uh, cheap gasoline, uh, which we, uh, which we continue, uh, which we continue uh, to have uh, under the circumstances. Well, what are, what are we to do uh, what, about that? What does that tell us uh, about the legacy of the Federalist Papers' uh, prediction? and uh, uh, prescription for representative democracy. Uh, I want to move to another point. <laughs> I, think, uh, I, think, I think it's important to draw a distinction between the capacity of representative democracy, or the system of representative democracy, to uh, produce oppression. Maybe that's the, the passion uh, that, uh, uh, that Mr. Epstein was uh, referring to. And, it's, and the capacity of representative government uh, to uh, produce effective government. Uh, I, I, I was uh, very interested to hear Judge Easterbrook's dissection of the current product of Madison's observations in respect to, uh, to, to factions. I think I, I'd like to think about it more uh, before reacting to it. Uh, but uh, he, he's certainly right when he says that the capacity of factions to work their will in the national legislative process or the national political process has become more effective. Uh, I think that's true. I heard less, and maybe I missed it, about their diminished capacity to accomplish the same result uh, within the states and local, local governments. Indeed, uh, having lived for the last 27 years uh, in the city of Berkeley, California, uh, I, I want to say that Madison's observation about the capacity of a, uh, of a faction uh, in, in a small unit, uh, repre no, repre I'm quite serious about this, representing a very modest majority uh, to be uh, both oppressive and disregarded uh, of the interests of the rather large minority, uh, the capacity to take extreme positions uh, could not be more strongly uh, brought home. Uh, Madison uh, must be up there or out there or wherever. Uh, that, uh, and when he thinks about Federalist 10, uh, he, squints, he squints at the city council in, uh, in, in, in Berkeley. Uh, I, I, and, and, I, and I do believe that as ineffective, as ineffective as national government has been, uh, and as, as easier as it has been for factions at the national level uh, to work their will in terms of serving their own interests. I think our more than 200 years of history does bear out uh, Madison's observation that the capacity to be oppressive, and I think there is a, a, a distinction between serving your own interests uh, and, and oppressing uh, certain minority groups, although as with most distinctions, it becomes somewhat fuzzy at the edges. Uh, but, but, but I think that distinction has been borne out. The capacity uh, to, to, to oppress underrepresented or, or minority groups can, uh, has been and continues uh, to be much more powerful at the state or local level uh, than it has been at the, uh, at the national level. Uh, uh, another uh, unconnected point, uh, representative democracy, the, uh, we, we were told that the core of representative democracy was the ability to turn out. You know, maybe maybe these representatives were going to represent uh, 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 factional interests, special interests, not work for the common wheel. But at least we could turn them out. Uh, there's something there's something incongruous about that observation and the re-election record of the members of the House of Representatives. I, I, I think it was said that even before Glasnost, we had a, a greater stability there than in the Supreme Soviet. Uh, in the in, in in the house, uh, there's something there's something not working right uh, about our, uh, our our system of uh, representative uh, democracy in that respect. Well, uh, so what do we do about all of this? Uh, I think my time is up. No, uh, I, I <laughs> five years ago in, in 1987 when we celebrated the bicentennial of the Constitution. Uh, I, uh, and, and the first time that I was called by some member of the media was writing a story about this, and I, and I was asked the quite obvious question of uh, how has our Constitution stood up over 200 years? 
thought there to be some changes made. Uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I have not uh, thought at least in any systematic or serious way about that. But on a few, few moments reflection, uh, I came to the following conclusion that I, I, I've now thought a little bit more about. I remember saying, well, the great issues of the day involve uh, uh, constitutional issues, involve uh, abortion, uh, busing, uh, school prayer, and, and uh, probably a few others. I said, those are not unimportant issues. But I do not believe uh, that these are the sorts of issues to which we ought to look uh, for constitutional, constitutional change. Uh, I said, I, I think it is the structural issues that we have to examine uh, and, and evaluate in terms of whether the legacy of the framers is, is today serving as well. And I said, first are the terms uh, of, our, of our governmental leaders. Uh, and I don't, I don't know the answers, but is, is two years right for the House of Representatives? Is a two-term limit right for the presidency each term of four years? And now uh, uh, it, to, to, to invade the first of the Holy of Holies is a, is a, a, lifetime, uh, is a lifetime term uh, right uh, for members of the federal judiciary, at least those uh, on the United States Supreme Court, given the policymaking role uh, that, 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 uh, that they've uh, assumed in our society. Uh, and, and none of this is meant, at least in time, and I want to be very clear about that, for what, in terms of the judiciary to be, uh, to be critical. Um, second, how about our system of campaign finance? Now, I think we're getting closer to home uh, on that issue. Uh, my own feeling is that the Supreme Court has wrestled with this issue, that Congress has wrestled with this issue. Uh, I'm, I'm not at all sure that either body uh, has come up with the with the correct answer, nor am I sure that they've come up with the incorrect answers. Uh, but at least I don't think uh, that the Constitution uh, has, in an effective way, provided either affirmative or negative solutions to that particular problem. And third, and this is where, to the extent that I had any credibility, I, I lost uh, all of it. Uh, I said, and I, I really think that uh, we ought we ought carefully to reexamine uh, the First Amendment's freedom of the press protection. Uh, for the media. Uh, the, the, I, I cannot believe that under any system of constitutional interpretation uh, that the, 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 it was contemplated uh, that the media should have the role or would have uh, the role, I may be dead wrong on this, but the, the powerful role that they have in our elective system, in our system of representative democracy. Uh, I think in the main, uh, I agree with the Supreme Court's decisions that have been protected, uh, have extended First uh, Amendment protection to the media. Uh, and I don't know, I, I do know of some things that I think are wrong. Not wrong as a matter of interpretation, but wrong as a matter of policy uh, that, we, that we ought to, uh, to re-examine. Uh, time does not uh, uh, permit me to go into those in detail, so I thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Chol Dean Cholper. Uh, now, the, uh, certainly as an important part of the program as the first part, uh, will be uh, some exchange with you, between you and the members of the panel, and maybe even among the members of the panel. To make that work, I think we need some house lights, because uh, the panelists are not able to see you, uh, thank you, not able to see you with your hand up. I'll try to uh, confine myself to the role of traffic cop, for which I was hired. And uh, uh, now open the floor for your questions. If you'll indicate that you want to speak in the usual way, we'll try to recognize you. Yes, sir. Um, in the past two weeks, the Brinkley Show and the Wall Street Journal have shown a map of North Carolina with a long line going from the northern part of the state to the southern part of the state that apparently follows Route, I believe, 95. And this is a new congressional district that results from the way the Voting Rights Act has been interpreted, in which the block voting assumptions of having blacks vote for blacks and whites only vote for whites is sort of crunched through computers and, and put onto a map. My question. Uh, for the panelists is whether the 1982 amendments to the Voting Rights Act, as currently interpreted by the Department of Justice and the Supreme Court, affirm or do not affirm the vision of representative democracy of, of the Federalist. To whom do you address your question, sir? Oh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dean Schofer. 
<laughs> Would you put the question one more time? My, my question is whether the block voting assumptions uh, surrounding the Voting Rights Act, as it is currently interpreted, affirm or do not affirm the vision of representative democracy in the Federalist. Without, without pretending to give an authoritative answer to that, I, I would say uh, that block voting is something that recognizes the political, political authority, the political force of factions, uh, that, as has been pointed out to us this morning by the other people on the panel, uh, that is one dynamic that was plainly rec recognized at the time uh, that the Federalist Papers were drafted. Now, wh wh whether that's a good thing or wh whether the, the statutory system, as interpreted, uh, is a good thing or a bad thing uh, in terms of, uh, I think it is accentuating block voting, is another matter, but I certainly think it's something that was recognized in the fact of those papers, maybe. Let me say something briefly. My, I have, of course, the usual problem that in my uh, judicial capacity, I don't even know that there are such things as laws until people bring, bring cases. So I'm saying nothing about the Voting Rights Act. But the, the <laughs> assumption of block voting was integral to the idea of faction. That is, that people would have uh, self-interests which they would serve by voting together, uh, producing factious legislation. But it was also integral to the plan that instead of facilitating that by legislation, it was to be fought structurally. That what Federalist Number 10 does is explain how it is possible to fight that form of self-interested behavior. So that when one is looking at the Federalist, you see a disposition to recognize its existence but to undercut it rather than to facilitate it. Can I just add to that that um, uh, as, a, as, a, as an empirical matter, it's really not obvious that um, lumping members of a particular group into a single voting bloc is actually consistent with their interests. So uh, the idea that uh, lots of people uh, take the position that uh, the interest of the groups would best be served if they had um, uh, the ability to influence uh, agendas at a no in a number of congressional districts rather than no influence in most districts and, and a disproportionate influence uh, uh, in one. So in addition to your very appropriate question with respect to the, uh, the consistency of the assumptions of the Voting Rights Act with the notions of representation that the framers had, which I think has been aptly addressed by uh, Dean Chopra and Frank Easterbrook, there's also the question just simply of the political efficacy of it as a, as a strategy. Uh, which I think is subject to considerable doubt. If, if I may violate my uh, canon not to play, but to referee, uh, you may find it interesting that uh, in the context of the remarks I made very briefly about this familiar principle of judicial self-restraint, is the reality that across the republic, three judge federal courts are confronting, uh, as we sit, uh, the matter of apportioning the state's congressional districts. Indeed, uh, I am one of them presently hearing a case in Michigan. Uh, we are mandated to reduce our congressman, our congressional delegation from 18 to 16, and both the Republicans and the Democrats agree to that. They also agree, <laughs> they also agree interestingly, that the amendment to uh, the Voting Rights Act, the 1982 amendment to the Voting Rights Act, Section 2, that you have referenced, impacts Michigan in a way that leaves two congressional districts uh, untouchable. And the plan submitted by both the Republicans and the Democrats, while radically different, uh, simply do not touch two congressional districts. And of course, they're, they're, therefore, they do not affect the congressmen sitting there, uh, despite the fact that we must lose two of 18 congressmen. That is generating some interesting briefing uh, on both sides because uh, they're finding themselves in agreement about the composition of untouchable districts. I expect that the uh, trial, which is week from Monday, uh, will generate even more interesting questions of how that operates in representative democracy. And from the perspective of what we're discussing today, uh, during the briefing period and in preparing myself for the trial, I find myself more and more comfortable with the business of federal judges and justice of Frankfurters.
Sick it. Well, uh, not to, I won't play anymore. May I uh, take another question for the panel, please? Don't be shy. I can't, yes, sir. I'm sorry I can't see you. Yeah, I, I was interested in picking up on the, uh, on the question of uh, representation uh, and what that's supposed to uh, include or mean. Uh, are representatives ideally supposed really to be something more than just representing the, the interests of, uh, of, of their constituents? Uh, how, how much of a play is there for we're, we're electing people who will be who perhaps are a little wiser than we are? Uh, how much was that was that was that in the federal papers? And is 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 that not a, a key thing for representatives to think if the whole concept of representative democracy is going to work? That is, is it not key that they think they're not they're representing the best interests of their constituents, not just what the majority of the petitions would think on every given issue? Uh, the you know. I guess I'd be interested in uh, comments from a couple of panels on that, especially in light of uh, how important interim polling figures are in terms of what representatives do on specific issues. To any of the panelists? To, to any of the panelists who would want to pick that up. Gentlemen? Well, I think it's clear that in the Federalist, there is a kind of hope for representatives who have this, what, what Professor Macy called Burkean quality of looking beyond their district. Uh, you know, if you look at Federalist 34 and 35, the, the question comes up with reference to how many representatives there are. And the anti-Federalists say, this is not enough representatives to represent all of the minute qualities, interests, opinions of, of the constituents. And I think the Federalist view is that representing minutely what your constituents think or want is bound to be a losing game because they are only a small fraction of the population. Um, th this is why I think it's somewhat puzzling to say that uh, you know, this advocacy representation is bound to win because it is at least paradoxical that uh, a representative speaking for only his small constituency is not simply outvoted by you know, 434 others. I'm reminded of the uh, Hamilton's statement in describing the possibility of having two presidents that it is idle to claim something is impossible if it has actually happened. But it's a little bit the way I feel about these discussions of the power of minority factions and of advocacy representatives. You know, I think we need to reflect on how, how is that really possible? Why doesn't the majority see that it can, can outvote these people? Can I add uh, one of the uh... Uh, one of the, uh, I think uh, David Epstein is extremely uh, uh, nice, and I think his politeness has uh, caused him to, to uh, perhaps mask the extent to which he and I have some pretty deep disagreements. Uh, and I think even uh, that, that uh, uh, I would, I try to bring these into sharper focus because they, they, they came up uh, uh, in, in response to this last question, um, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, in particular on this as. as uh, uh, Dave just mentioned on this issue of, of advocacy uh, that I was talking about in my remarks, and it relates directly to your question. Uh, and, and, and one way of looking at it is to ask the question um, uh, that was asked in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in David's talk, why don't people go to Congress uh, to seek a vindication or support of their rights? Why do they always go uh, to the courts, uh, particularly where um, courts are exercising a lot of self-restraint these days in the protection of those rights. One might wonder how much virtue there is when judges exercise self-restraint where constitutional rights are at stake. But anyway, uh, that's where I guess uh, I would, uh, would perhaps jump off the, the wagon to judges on the, on the panel. Um, and the, but, but I think the answer is clear, right? Why people don't go to Congress to support uh, uh, their rights. And the reason they don't um, is because it's a waste of time. I mean, imagine you're petitioning Howard Metzenbaum or Ted Kennedy, but gee, my property rights have been violated. <laughs> uh, 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 or rent control, for example. I mean, one of you uh, sort of flipping with your clicker, but by uh, CNN and watching uh, uh, the, uh, the confirmation hearings of, uh, say, uh, of uh, any of the recent justices, but most particularly, I think, uh, uh, Judge Bork's confirmation hearing suggests that 
strong rationale. Uh, it's the simple matters, everything is up for grabs. And I think the reason for that, and this gets to the answer to the question, has to do with what I would add is, is a, as what I would put in as a, I, what I would try to perhaps ambitiously describe as a, as a important footnote to Frank Easterbrook's comments. I agree with everything Frank said, basically, except his point about self-restraint, the rights are at stake. But what, what Frank Easterbrook was talking about was the fact that an enormously important point he was making was, gee, you know, we had this agency gap uh, that, that existed at the time of the framing between people and their representatives. And this agency gap uh, was the fact that people can't monitor their representatives very well and control their actions, people and particularly special interest groups. And this gave these representatives freedom to operate. Uh, and now, uh, uh, Frank points out, that um, a variety of things have happened, including better communications, the world has gotten smaller in a meaningful way, so that this agency, this, this agency gap has decreased. Now, the, the footnote I want to add here is that all of the reasons that uh, Frank Easterbrook gave for this uh, uh, contraction in agency space are sort of exogenous. That is to say, they're, they're exogenous to Congress. They're, they're happenstance of, 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 uh, of, 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 of technological change and greater communications. And that, those are important reasons. I don't disagree with any of them, but they're not the only reasons. That is, uh, Congress has operated uh, to real, Congress realizes that it benefits by reducing this agency space because it increases the amount of political support it can get and other kinds of support it can get from special interest groups. So Congress has organized the committee system. It's organized the delegation of, uh, of authority to administrative agencies. Um, it's organized, uh, particularly, as I said, the committee system to pack preference outliers, to make log rolling easier, to, as I said in my talks, lower the, the decision-making cost of government in such a way as to um, uh, enable Congress, in essence, to make credible commitments to interest groups that they are going to, that they, Congress, will come through uh, on, uh, on the special interest group deals that are, are promised. Or to put it in sort of law and economics terms, the framers really wanted uh, Congress and the courts and the executive to operate as a political market uh, and, 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 uh, and markets in some contexts, as Ronald Coast has observed, are costlier vehicles for, for um, uh, generating outcomes than firms. And Congress has done a very good job of transforming uh, the lawmaking process from, from a costly market process to a relatively less costly um, a set of, uh, of uh, mechanisms that operate at the firm level. And, and here my point is simply that um, the, the changes that Frank Easterbrook were, were describing with respect to the greater ability of interest groups to control outcomes are not only because of these exogenous technological factors, but they're also a function of a very clever uh, operation of the internal rules of, of, of Congress uh, and uh, administrative agencies that also have uh, uh, reduced the, the uh, the cost of, of factional and interest group uh, uh, influence. Thank you. The gentleman uh, in your left. Um, this is mainly directed at Professor Macy and, and Judge Easterbrook. who both brought up the idea that uh, Congress is being more direct and more responsive to the, their uh, constituency has, you know, in part been part of their argument for the legitimacy of their increased power. I'm wondering of your views of the increased responsiveness of the presidency and the increased directness of, his, of the selection system for the presidency and his argument for uh, that, that being his legitis, legitimacy to, for his, his you know, goals. His discussion. Could I ask you what you mean by legitimacy in, in this respect? Um, but I don't remember which of the gentleman brought it up, but uh, one of them pointed out that uh, the argument was being used by Congress that because they are the more direct representatives of the you know the constituency of the people, that because of that they uh, were the, should be given more powers because they were more direct representatives. Well, I, I, I would not describe the, the 
portions of the Federalist I was talking about as a rationale why people should be given more power. Madison was in the 10th and 51st Federalist taking uh, the desirability of a strong national government as justified on other grounds, and then trying to see how faction could be controlled, how best controlled. One of the important ways of doing that was the diversity of bases of political support. And although I didn't mention it in my talk, it's quite obvious that Madison made favorable references to the indirect election of the president as one of the ways in which that would occur, that the House is elected directly but from districts and states. The senators are elected by the legislatures of the states. The president is elected by the Electoral College, designed as a deliberative body, never worked out that way. But in terms of legitimacy, the historical changes that have taken place are, are just changes. First, the method of election of the president has been altered in part by, by constitutional amendment. And second, as Madison himself said several times in the, the Federalist Papers, if the structure of government works out differently from the way in which we predict it will work out, that is because the people have come to accept the desirability of a difference. That one can't point to a different working out of government as undermining its, illegitim undermining its legitimacy, given that it, the Constitution was designed to accommodate differences and change. And the possibility of change was one of the rationales given for why this was a desirable Constitution and the position advanced by people like Brutus and the federal farmer that should, be, should be rejected. Any other panelists wish to respond to that? If not, we have time for one question, but we'll make it time for two if we can abbreviate the responses to the first one. Yes, sir. I just wanted to ask, last year, about a year ago, there was a budget deal between the President and Congress. And this type of negotiation, I felt, was seemed to be inimical to the spirit of the Constitution. I wonder if you could comment if you feel that direct negotiations to influence legislation between the executive and legislative branches would dilute the purposes of the Constitution, especially in what Judge Easterbrook talked about to counteract faction. I'd say, I would say, uh, well, I was going to say no, I don't think so. I mean, you know, the President has this independent power to veto, and one of the ways he exercises this is by letting it be known in advance what he's going to veto. And so it seems to me a pretty small step from there to, to have negotiations. I mean, the Federalists insist that each branch have its own separate authority and, and that it not be blended, but I don't see why they can't talk to each other. <laughs> I guess I would take a slightly different uh, view and, and say, say simply that um, uh, I think your, your question comes into really sharp focus if you look, for example, at an issue like the line item of veto. Uh, and the idea is um, Reagan and, 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 and most particularly Bush in the State of the Union address well, we said, gee, I really need the line item. You know, really, wouldn't it be, be great? And of course, as, as Gordon Krovitz and others have pointed out, um, um, it's not obvious that, that uh, that's really true. That is, it's not. It seems to me the president is, is really uh, acting acting strategically when he says he wants a line item veto. He could, in fact, if he really felt strongly about his issue, policy positions, which he doesn't, he could simply veto more stuff. <laughs> And the, the lack of a legislative veto is enormously uh, convenient for Congress because it allows a president to blame Congress uh, for unpopular laws that he's signing uh, by saying, ooh, well, I'd really veto these 12 things, but they're part of this omnibus bill, and I'm unable to, um, una I am unable to do that. I mean, the idea of the separation of powers, of course, as, I, as I'm trying to emphasize, is to, uh, as, is to uh, uh, increase the decisions cost of government, make it more difficult for the branches to reach consensus and thereby result in, in fewer laws, the better these uh, these uh, the coordinate branches of government are able to co cooperate, um, uh, the worse it is for us, in, in my view. And that's why I don't think it's a good idea to look at the power of Congress in isolation or to look at the power of the presidency in isolation. It's rather to look at, 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 at a, an equilibrium condition in which, um, as Congress attempts to assert its authority, we should want the president to uh, take a greater role in asserting its authority uh, because that's what's consistent with a uh, system of, of checks and balances. This manifests itself in the modern era, of course, in the tug of war over administrative agencies, which is how the, the framers' uh, balance of powers debate is really playing itself out in the end of the, uh, at the end of the century. Thank you, Professor. Mr. Epstein? I just want to take a minute to try and reply to Mr. Macy's reply to me. 
Um, you know, in saying that, that people look to the courts to vindicate their rights, uh, this is obviously because the Constitution is not the Constitution as it was recommended by the Federalists. We do have the Bill of Rights, we have the subsequent amendments, and so you know, I'm not passing judgment on that. It's just, all I'm saying is that that is a very different system, and that when you say you can look to the court to secure your right, you assume that rights can be legally specified uh, kind of in these general terms, and, and that that can cover the cases. I mean, this whole distinction between regulation and taking, and that, that is somehow to be the basis of you know, a decision about who has what rights. But Madison would say that's really a, a, you know, not going to work. That's, that's not a sufficient basis for deciding what justice is. And, and so that this legal approach is, is insufficient. I mean, I think in all of this discussion of whether the, the framers' design has worked out, one of the questions is always compared to what? I mean, the framers describe these institutions as having certain tendencies or probabilities. You can say, well, there's, there's powerful factions that have imposed rent control. Um, you know, maybe that's right, but in Federalist 10, Madison is more emphatic that the extended sphere will prevent injustice than he is that it will uh, secure the public good, and maybe that's been vindicated. And by preventing injustice, he meant things like repudiation of debts. I mean, we, we haven't had that, say, so what they call the sponge. Government just says, you know, you debtors, don't bother. Uh, you know, if you think about what it means to protect rights, uh, it's, it's possible. I mean, I think we've, we grow more ambitious as our basic rights are protected, and we obviously hope, hope for more. But uh, I think if you're looking for how to judge the Federalist, you have to keep in mind what is a reasonable standard for a successful form of government. Thank you, Mr. Epstein. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, I'm sorry, I, and sir, I'm sorry, our time is up. Uh, I'm a great guy, but the conference chairman says we have to blow the whistle. <laughs> Uh, let me just say, perhaps at the next session you could put your question. We hope, ladies and gentlemen, that we've ventilated some useful ideas about representative democracy in this panel this morning. Professor Macy's treatment of the duality of that concept, Mr. Epstein's uh, examination of the extent to which the hopes and purposes uh, of the early Federalists have been realized, particularly with respect to their passions and their interests. The, uh, the, uh, Judge Frank Easterbrook's uh, Thoughts about the significance of factions is conceived by Madison and uh, their capacity in the 10th and is conceived by him in the 10th and 51st and, and their capacity to impact representative democracy uh, as we close out this century. And, and our final speaker, uh, Dean Jesse Chauffeur's uh, thoughts about the extent to which in the light of current political uh, reality uh, that Madison's visions for representative self-government survive. It's been a great privilege for me to have served as traffic director for these very distinguished panelists, and I thank you for that. We'll take a break now, and uh, thereafter, uh, come back uh, for the panel, which will be chaired by my colleague, Judge Buckley, and uh, that panel will conclude the morning business. Thank you.